Okay, today's lecture is about therapy. I actually broke it into two parts. Therapy part one is what I'm going to do. There'll be another um, video for therapy part two. This is the quote I like to start off with because I struggle with depression and anxiety. And people go, oh, just think happy thoughts. It's like, well, if it was that easy, people just being positive, you know, I could have solved the problem a long time ago. You know, it's like if you struggle with weight, just don't eat so much food or eat more food or whatever it is. It's like, no, it's more physiological. People have a misunderstanding of it. I don't want to go joker right now, but I really do. And speaking of misunderstandings, early on, what we thought mental illness was caused by was demons. And so the first kind of therapy was exorcism because I got to get the demon out. And so I kind of agree with this in a way, depression and anxiety are demons to me, but not like demons over here, but they are kind of demons. So for a long time, we've had this misunderstanding. We talked a little bit about it, you know, back to Hippocrates was one of the first to reject, you know, demonic possession. So asylums, another, you know, <clears throat> thing that illustrates how we mistreated mentally ill people. We'll just lock them up and it's like we don't know what to do with them. If we can just lock them up, keep them away from people so they don't hurt themselves or other people. That's my whole problem. It's like you're not really patient centric. You're more about the community. I understand that piece, but still, we don't have this understanding of mental illness. Modern therapy came out of the introduction of these two guys. We know about Sigmund Freud. I'm going to go off on him here in just a minute, but it's like he was introduced to this guy, Joseph Brewer. Why was that important? Because Brewer was, uh, I think I have it on here, hypnotist. And what they would do is hypnotize Freud's patients, and then when they were underneath uh, hypnotism, Freud would talk to them. If I can get this off of here. And as he talked to them, they would divulge. A lot of their iceberg would come out, so to speak. And we'll talk about this in just a second. But now, if you think about it, it used to, we were either trying to uh, perform exorcisms or we were, you know, locking people away. Now what we're doing is coming in, talking to a therapist. Maybe we don't have to be underneath hypnosis, you know, but we're talking to a therapist and this leads into modern diagnosis and treatment. Now, diagnosis is what we did last time. That was all the different kinds of disorders. But just because I have a particular health problem, there's a lot of different solutions like naturopathic doctor, traditional Western medicine, whatever. You know what I mean? So I'm going to talk about five kinds of treatment. I'm on here. You don't have to write this down right now, but it does start with Freud and kind of chronologically move this way. So we get the initial people that go against Freud and then cognitive behavioral therapy. That's like had a huge impact on therapy and treatment and then also drugs, you know, and uh, trying to restore those chemical imbalances. So these are the five I'm going to go through. Good news and bad news. You know, there's five. There's a lot of information, but they're kind of organized and they're pretty simple. You know what I mean? So on the next slide, I'm going to go into the psychoanalytic approach. OK, so here we are. Let me make sure my pins on here. So for this approach, for the test, just think about Freud. He was the father of psychoanalysis and really the father of therapy in some ways. You know, this approach of, you know, bringing people in, getting them into a relaxed state, talk about your problems. And we talked about that with Joseph Brewer. So if you think about to me, his biggest contribution is this whole idea of the, you know, iceberg and that we're unaware of a lot of things, especially people that struggle with mental illness. One of the big things they might deal with is secrets. Now think back to Shutter Island, you know what I mean? He doesn't want to deal with the secrets. And so the whole goal of a psychoanalytic Freudian therapist is we got to get down there and we're going to get, you know, down to these secrets that you've locked away from yourself. And what we're going to do is eventually bring them to light. Now it might be painful, but once they get brought to light, this is what they're trying to do in Shutter Island. Say, hey, dude, look at your wife, look at the kids, you know, go back and watch the movie. They're trying to bring the secret, the beach ball to light, but he don't want to see it. You know what I mean? So the whole goal with the Freudian approach is dealing with this hidden material. Now, I love this quote. I don't think I've shown it in this class yet. You're only as sick as your secrets. Maybe I have, uh, but I'll show it again probably later. 
But, you know, here I'm talking about, you know, mentally sick. Later on, I'll talk about physically sick when we get into stress. But you are just as sick as your secrets. Where I came from, I hate secrets. I've rolled too many times on Molly. I don't think secrets are good for you. You know what I mean? Like a root canal. Yeah, you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to go to the dentist. But the dentist got to get down in there. I've had several root canals and get all that nerve out. If you leave some behind, you're screwed, dude. So the same thing with the secret. You need to delve down into the bottom of the iceberg and get that shit out of there. Because if you don't, you're going to be pushing that iceberg, I mean, beach ball down there, sorry, your whole life, like, you know, uh, Shutter Island and not able to deal with the secret and bring it to light. This is why I like the Freudian approach a lot, but I'm probably jaded because I grew up in a family of secrets. Denial is the glue that holds a dysfunctional family together. So, here's what I have from Carl Jung. When we deal, deal with problems, the first thing we do is run away from the hardness, the darkness, whatever. It's like, oh no, I want to go into the light. But he says the only way you can solve the problem is to venture into the darkness and then come back out again. And so if you're in my other class, I go into the hero's journey and the role of the shaman. And this is like, you know, your spirit quest, but or vision quest. But I don't want to go into that right now. Oh, yeah, I have demons on here. I'd love to lecture about demons. Okay, one of the demons I'd love to lecture about, if I can come on here, is Lucifer. So this is what I think causes your mental problems, the accuser. Now, you can label him somewhere else, but Lucifer, the word, actually comes from two words, and maybe you can see it on here, L-U-X, and this says F-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, looks affair. <clears throat> what is looks affair? It means light bringer. Lucifer is the light bringer. He's the morning star. It's like, that's another name for Lucifer. Well, why would he be a morning star or a light bringer? Here's my two. When Jesus is in the desert and Lucifer comes to him and tempts him, he, it seems like he's bringing the darkness. But actually, what happens is in the three temptations, especially in one of the famous ones where he says, get thee behind me, say, and it's like he has a like chance to resist the temptation and shine brighter than he's ever shown because of the tempter. If there is no temptation, Jesus doesn't need to shine because everything shines. You know what I mean? And so the ultimate darkness allows him his lesson to shine. Now, if you're in my religion class, I'll talk about light bringer. But if you leave heaven, whatever religion you're in, you know, and come down here to earth, I call it Earth School. I steal this from Gary Zukov. But you come down here to Earth School, and heaven is perfect, but down here is perfect. Then there's no lessons because you went from heaven to heaven to heaven to heaven. I hope that makes sense. But if this part down here is not perfect and it has a lot of trials and tribulations, this is where Earth School lessons come from. And who gives the trials and tribulations, the temptations? Uh, Lucifer, the light bringer. And so really Lucifer is one of God's teachers, one of God's best teachers, because in all these trials and tribulations, especially maybe even the COVID virus, whatever's going on, you go, why the fuck is this happening to me? Yeah, but this is your test, and then you will have a testimony. If it was not, if it was perfect down here, you wouldn't have a testimony. And so this is the part that I teach about in my other classes. Now, sometimes I look at it this way. If I can erase all this shit off of here, you can't have an Easter Sunday without having a good Friday. It's like, but there's nothing good about Friday over here. You're nailed to a cross, screaming out to God. Oh, my goodness. Where are you? I'm roaring. You can't hear me. <laughs> you know, but everybody wants to shine bright right here. But you have to go through Good Friday to get your own personal Easter Sunday. This is why I do like Catholicism. It's redemptive suffering, which I don't want to go off on it, but I do teach psychology or religion. Okay, enough. So unless you learn to face your own shadows, I have this quote, you'll just keep seeing them over and over. Trust me. You know, the demons keep coming until you stand up and say no more. Now, I also love this one right here. If I can erase this up here. If you're not willing to face your demons, if you can't find the courage to take on your fear and hurt and anger, you might as well wrap them up with a bow and give them to your children. Because this is how we transmit fear. And this is why I'm not for fear. You know, Jesus is not for fear. God's not for fear. Whatever you worship, I don't think God is for fear. He is for, you know, the light. 
Okay, this is the last little part for Freud. There's six psychoanalytic methods, or you can always say Freudian methods, to get to information that's hidden. If you think about it, the whole goal is to get to this hidden information. But a lot of the times the patient doesn't know they're hiding it, Shutter Island. So the first one is easy, hypnosis. A lot of them will be a review. We hypnotize people. That's what Freud started doing. If you're in a trance, then all of a sudden, maybe I can get in your iceberg easier than if you're guarded awake. The second kind you've already known too is projective test. That's like ink blot test or the TAT where that lady was standing outside the door so that you like project yourself into the test. Somehow you inadvertently, like a Freudian slip, put yourself in there. And then speaking of Freudian slips, uh, free association. Freud is uh, best known for this, you know, the whole lay down on a couch and relax and start talking, stream of consciousness style. Just talk about anything. I don't care. No filter. Just let everything come out. So if you can take your filter off, which a lot of times people can't, his idea is that when they relax and just let anything come to mind and don't censor, don't filter, I'm the wrong person to talk to, <laughs> then everything will just blurt out, Freudian slip, and then a lot of their iceberg will start to come out. I hope I made sense on those first three. Now, you change slide one. Number four is examining resistances. If you ever, like, you know, find a patient doesn't want to talk about something, it's like, oh, I don't want to talk about my mom. It's like, well, we need to go talk about that. Why are you resisting me? So anything you resist, that's the whole movie, Shutter Island, right? He's resisting, resisting, resisting. I don't have anything. I don't have any problems. I don't need to talk to you. That reminds me also of Goodwill Hunting. Okay, dream interpretation, we've already talked about this. Freud believed dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, Camino Real, and so this royal road, if you can interpret dreams, dreams are your iceberg, you know, for lack of a better, you know, analogy. And so transference is also something we've kind of talked about, projection, right? I see my problems in other people, not myself. Maybe I do this with my therapist, start saying, well, you're all critical and angry and this, that, and he's like, no, Tim, you're projecting your stuff on me or vice versa they could do cross transference where they start to see me as a child it's like no I'm not your kid you know what I mean so a lot of times this is why I don't have therapists that are dudes because then they become my dad it's like I'm just a dude Tim I'm not your dad <laughs> you know so that would be me projecting onto this guy you know the qualities that uh, I see okay if you have any questions about those six for the test definitely give me an email Okay, the second approach is the humanistic approach, and out of all the approaches, it's my favorite. Um, I didn't used to like it so much, but now I do. Um, the idea is people are naturally good. It's kind of a radical idea, but this is why I love Mr. Rogers. I wish I would have put a bunch of Mr. Rogers quotes in here. I like you just the way you are. You don't need to be bigger, stronger, richer, faster, prettier. And the idea is you're inherently good, not inherently evil or bad. The Freudian approach kind of sees people as bad and dark. And if you don't believe me, I think Freud right here, I have found little that is good about human beings on the whole. In my experience, most of them are trash. That's very dark. That's people that are naturally evil, need to be controlled. That's why we had the id ego, super ego, all this stuff we talked about where you're always pushing down those bad parts of yourself. And the humanists were like anti-Freudians in a way because they're going, no, you're inherently good and you do know what you're doing your own life. And so humanism here, Carl Rogers is one of the big humanists. And so is Abraham Maslow, the guy that had the uh, self-actualization triangle. But anyway, people are basically good, and you already have the power to heal yourself. You don't need some trippy, weird, you know, decoding that you don't understand, Shutter Island style. It's like you're a god, not an expert also as a therapist. I'm not this expert. I'm decoding you, and you don't know something about yourself. It's like you already know. You know what you need to work on, most likely, if it's anger, if it's depression that you're struggling with, and that somehow I'm going to let you come to your own solution. Now, this is what annoys me about these guys. It's like, dude, I'm paying you $160 an hour. You're not going to tell me what to do? It's like, I can figure that out in my apartment. <laughs> you know what I mean? But they want to push the onus back on you 
because then it empowers you instead of having that locus of control. We'll talk about this a little bit later. This external, you're going to have more of an internal locus of control where you control your behavior, not the world controls you. Now, one of the quotes that's really hard for me to look at comes from Carl Rogers. I mentioned his name. He's one of the fathers of humanism. Is that He says, when I accept myself just as I am, then I start to change. That's what I need to do, completely accept him just the way he is, and that's the only way he's ever going to change, because I can't work on myself. I am me. That's like a chicken working on themselves to try to be a fox. You know what I mean? You just are who you are. Okay, so this is what Abraham Maslow, remember, he was the guy that had the triangle and had all the different levels. We talk about this. But he says that people are fundamentally good. Right here he says it. People are good. If... But there's a big if, I'm getting draw happy on here, their wishes are for affection and security. That's why I'm about the lovey-dovey cover. You can give people food and water, that has nothing to do with anything. People need lovey-dovey, and the people that are deprived from lovey-dovey, we saw what happened to them and saw, oh, girl, he too thirsty ain't just a funny thing. You know what I mean? When you get too thirsty, then you do odd, weird things. Think about people that are shooters, you know? If they had a lot of love and attention already, they wouldn't be doing that. So, anyway, back to the lecture at hand. This affection and security is like sunlight or water I give to a plant or good dirt or nutrients or whatever. If I give it, the plant will thrive. A human will thrive. But if I withdraw love and attention, guess what? Then you wither. I don't know. This is everything I am. And so this is what I'm fixing to go off. There's nothing wrong with you, but maybe there's something wrong with the environment that you're planted in right now. I don't know if you remember this from the first day of a class, but I was just in the desert taking pictures of saguaros because they're blooming. I should have brought the picture in. But anyway, like when I look at a saguaro in the desert, it's like it's just a saguaro. It's not good or bad. But if I were to take it up to Flagstaff, that's going to die. Why? Because I changed its environment, changed the altitude, precipitation, all these different factors, you know, that, it, you know, but if I take an alpine tree over here, like I said on the first day of class, I think I use this example, and bring it down to the desert, it's going to die. There's nothing wrong with the tree. There's nothing wrong with you. Sometimes you're in the wrong environment. This is everything I'm about, you know, because I feel like a fish out of water in certain environments. So a therapist, according to the humanist, back to the lecture, <laughs> needs to be genuine, which means it's not phony. This is my problem with therapists. A lot of times it's like, dude, when I have to start lying to my therapist, I feel like I'm on Joker. It's like, okay, Tim, don't let them know that you're real suicidal because then they're going to lock your shit up. Just you're kind of depressed, but not that depressed. So I'm already on a lying streak with my therapist half the time. Okay, <laughs> so that's just me out myself. Empathic. You have to have a sense of empathy, like you can empathize, put yourself in the other person's shoes. That's why I think sensitives, you know what I mean? I'm always talking about sensitives or empaths. And then finally, accepting. This is the big thing that the humanists say, that a lot of people aren't accepted for who they are. And this is what I wanted to talk about. You don't have to remember this for the lecture, but it definitely uh, will relate to your personal life. Okay, this is not Tim saying this, but, you know, this is what the humanists say, and I agree with it, that a lot of us grow up in conditional families. What we grow up in is unconditional families. You don't have to write this down, but parents accept and love the person for who they are. You don't withdraw love or attention just because people don't act right. Now, you might have consequences, but there's not like this underlying theme of there's something wrong with you. Like in conditional families, if you behave correctly, you get love and attention. But as soon as um, you act like yourself, you're not love for the person you are, but on the condition that you behave correctly. Now, I don't know if you grew up here. I hope you didn't, but I did grow up here. And it's like, I'm not trying to like, you know, throw stones, but this is where I grew up. And a lot of us grew up in conditional land. And so what happens when you grow up? Well, I only feel good about Tim when other pe when I meet other people's expectations. Not when I meet mine, but if I make everybody else happy, then uh, then I'm happy. 
That should sound familiar. It should sound like something. That's like, you know, I, I'm a cat right here, and I grew up in a family of dogs, and as long as I bark and wolf and, like, go, you know, lift my leg and pee on things right and fetch sticks and all these different things, then I get loved. But as soon as I act like a cat, but I am a cat, then I don't get loved. Hello, my name is People Pleaser. It's like, I'm going to put on a dog uniform, and as long as I put on my dog uniform, I'll get love. But then that means I punk myself out, and I completely act phony to get love. <laughs> I don't know if you play this game, but this is Tim. It sucks. I hate this game. So if you have this problem, you might need to read one of these books. I want to focus on this one, but Melody Beatty is so amazing. Either one of these books, you know, talk about the shame that comes along with growing up in one of these families. And so this is about people pleasing. Don't be afraid of losing people. So in dysfunctional families, there becomes this rift, according to John Bradshaw. And so you get this divide, I can't draw right here, between parent and child. Okay, and it could be uh, to, to a lot of things, abuse, neglect, you know what I mean, whatever, anger, all these different things. So that's not up to me right now. But <clears throat> what happens with the child, they start thinking two things. A, there's something wrong with me because I'm not acting right. I'm always in trouble. I'm doing the wrong thing, blah, blah, blah. I'm just having to act right. And if I could just act right, people would love me. If I behave right, people would love me. I have that cooked in me. That's me. That's my DNA or these two things. That's why the first time I read them, I was like, oh, shit. How does this dude know this? You know what I mean? Because he grew up in that family. And if I act like myself, they won't love me. That's like being a cat in a family of dogs. Now, there's different roles that he says that occur in this family, the hero child. I try to be the hero. Just do everything perfectly, you know, and then maybe you'll get the love you want. I'm 53 and I'm still waiting for it. Placator, let's just make peace. We won't talk about all the abuse. Let's just like gloss everything over. Um, the scapegoat, oh, I'm just going to act out and be really bad. You know, if I'm bad, I might as well just go with it. Uh, the lost child, I'll just be quiet. And just, if I'm real quiet, they won't come after me. And then the mascot, I'm just going to be real silly. Everything's a joke. And if I just make a joke out of everything, we don't have to be real about shit. And so, I don't know. I grew up in this family. I don't know. I have my own problems. I got to look at my own problems. But this is part of my problem is trying to be the hero child, thinking that somehow she'll come walking through the door and I'll get married and everything will just work out because I did everything right. And that's not true. So this is my quote. I'm tired of pretending to be somebody else. I'm not. So other people are more comfortable. It's like, dude, I'm just being me. You know what I mean? It's like, and now it's like, why are you doing that? It's like, because I'm being Tim. And so that's the hard part that, you know, I deal with is this mask. I don't know if you deal with this mask like I do. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's come from Richard Bach. He wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull. I don't know if I can get my mind up on that one. I'll read it to you though. My religion class, like I do a, a, a project on Jonathan. But he says right here, the bond that links your true family is not one of blood, but of respect and joy in each other's life. That means acceptance. I'm going to accept you exactly the way you are. And rarely do members of one family grow up underneath the same roof. That means you meet your family outside your genetic family. A lot of times it's easier for those people to accept you. This is why I love gay people. Because it's like, dude, it's like, this is who I am. And it's like, either accept me or don't accept me. You know what I mean? I always just wish I was gay sometimes just so I can go to my parents just like this is just me you know what I mean coming out of the closet but sometimes when you're just going I'm just Tim it's hard you know for people to get that that oh yeah this is me I'm a cat okay so remember when I talked on the first day of class too if I grow up in a toxic environment eventually I'll start to think there's something wrong with me that's my whole problem I think there's I'm a bad person it's like no if I get into a healthier environment people will celebrate me and I'll feel better about myself and then I'll understand there was something wrong with that water so I think I have a couple of things left for the day. And the last two things I have left is this idea of family, because family is supposed to be somebody that's that healthy water that's building us up. And so that's why you have to be careful. Your friends are your family in a way, too, who you surround yourself with. Are they healthy or toxic? And in your family, 
this is why I also take this from, you know, gay folk, because back in the 80s and 90s, you know, the code word, because back then it wasn't that cool to be real out and gay or queer, and then you would just ask each other, are you family? Because we take care of one another and accept each other and love each other just the way we are, because our families don't. Okay, so anyway, I hope you like that part of the lecture, and the very last quote I have on here, the very is Mr. Rogers. He says, don't ever give up on yourself or your dreams. You're worthwhile. Just remember to always be who you are because that person is very special. There's no person in the whole world like you, and I like you just the way you are. I thought I was going to make it through without crying. I love you guys. That's my lecture for today. I'll give therapy part two next time.